Hi, everybody. Rich Wisniewski, and I'm sort of the host for these sessions. I like to thank you all for taking time out of your Saturday. I don't know about you, but it is beautiful outside today. So uh, thanks for, uh, for spending some time with us. Um, this is the second of the Erie Lackawanna Historical Society's um, live uh, programs via the internet. And uh, we hope you enjoy them and, and hope we can continue them. Um, anybody who has a program that they think they might like to share, please get in touch with Paul and uh, he'll walk you through what's, what's needed to, to make it happen. Um, when we do start the presentation, we're gonna ask that everybody please stay on mute um, on Zoom and that you type your questions into the chat window and Paul will be collecting the information and he'll help Alex um, at the end of the presentation go through the questions. Wanted to uh, first though ask uh, the Chairman Michael Connor uh, to say a few words uh, for us today. Well, thank you. I uh, uh, unfortunately was unable to get to the first of these sessions and I uh, uh, had some other railroad business of all things, but uh, just with what I've seen in the, in the last uh, 30 minutes, this is an excellent, excellent uh, uh, tool for helping to learn more about our railroad that, that you've all been putting together. And I fully support it and hope to become a more, more of a participant. Uh, uh, the Erie Lackawanna Railroad Historical Society uh, has had to face the, uh, uh, like all organizations, the coronavirus and, and the problem of having no ability to uh, have in-person uh, meetings. Uh, I don't know yet what our, what's gonna be the situation in uh, 2021. Uh, the board is still considering it, but it's, uh, it's still pretty iffy uh, for my health reasons. Uh, but this, uh, what we're doing today is something that probably we wouldn't have come up with if it hadn't have been for the virus. And uh, this is gonna be a permanent part of our future. And I uh, certainly uh, uh, encourage all of you to uh, uh, participate. And if you've got some, uh, some items for a, for a uh, presentation, um, get in touch with, uh, with us. And uh, uh, if you can't, don't wanna do it alone, I think we can get some partners on it too. But again, thank you very much for being here today on behalf of uh, all of the, the uh, members of the, of the Erie Lackawanna Railroad Historical Society. And uh, we've got a, we're memorializing a great railroad that deserve a better, much, much better fate than, uh, than it, it got. Uh, I won't mention the word Conrail in there, but uh, you hear me loudly from there. Thank you very much and welcome aboard. Thank you, Michael. Um, we're gonna get started with the presentation now. As I mentioned, I'd ask you to please just put your questions or comments into the chat window and they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. At that time, uh, the conference will stay open and the you have the ability to interact with others kind of like we were just doing at the beginning here. We would just ask, we have, we have one prerequisite, keep the talk to the Erie Lackawanna, to the railroad and don't wander off into um, subjects far from that, okay? Thank you. All right, so Alex, uh, this is the introduction that he gave me. Any fan of Northeastern railroads, especially the Erie, has likely come across the photographs of James E. Bailey. A photographer for Meadville, Pennsylvania, Bailey detailed all of the Erie Railroad stations, both through photography and on paper between 1909 and 1911. Several books, including the famed The Next Station Will Be series, have featured Bailey's photographs and today they are being presented through a new and exciting perspective. Join Alex Prisgintas as he uses AI software to colorize Bailey's early 20th century images of the Erie Road stations in Orange County, New York. A lifelong resident of Orange County, Alex <clears throat> is a junior at Marist College studying public history in the Hudson River Valley. Over the past eight years, he has given more than 30 programs in the tri-state area on various genres of local history, including the Erie Railroad. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Including the Erie Road Newburgh shortcut 
and Edward Henry Harriman's Incline Railroad, uh, the, the Harriman Incline, that's a presentation I remember Alex giving at a, um, uh, one of the ELHS spring meetings a few years ago. So Alex, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I would certainly love to thank Rich, Paul, and everyone else at ELHS for making these virtual events possible. They're critical to continuing the lifeblood of these historical societies, and I think they're a wonderful way of engaging the audience. And additionally, this program would not be possible without the help of Jim Hutzler, who's been able to digitize and place all of Bailey's images online for free public use. And he's got a wealth of information, and I encourage everyone that is interested in Erie Road history to check out that website. I can include it at the end of the program. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to my program, Through Bailey's Lens. And today we'll be looking at some of James E. Bailey's photographs in Orange County through a colorized form. Hey, Alex, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you find a way to just be a little bit louder, please? Does that sound better? Yes, definitely. Okay, very Thank good. You. You're welcome. So before we get started, I always think it's important to take a look at the history behind an individual. And hold on one second. I apologize, I'm having some issues coordinating the program. All right, so let's try this. I apologize, everyone. I'm having some issues with the screen sharing function. All right. So as I've talked before, I apologize for that delay. Um, I always think it's important to look at the history behind an individual. And I was surprised to see in books such as like The Next Station will be, there was not a lot of historical information discussing Bailey. So I went to some newspapers. All these newspapers I found were from Meadville, Pennsylvania, where he was largely centered. These first two from between 1900 and 1910 detail his photography work. This first one from 1901 in the Meadville Evening Republican discussed how Bailey of the Erie Dispatcher's office was one of the quote, most successful amateur photographers in the city. And even at the end, you can see that this newspaper detailed that Mr. Bailey as an artist in the heart of interior photography. This one discusses his work on the Taylor Hose Company. Moving a little later in time, the second article is from 1902, also from the Meadville Evening Republican. And we can see here Bailey, of course, described as uh, being with the Erie and discussing um, his photography of the collapsed bridge at Buckingham Junction. And um, that his prints are, quote, unusually perfect, bringing out very glamorous views. Now, moving later in time, we will see Bailey's further work with the Erie between 1910 and 1920. Here in this first article from the Medieval Evening Republican in May of 1913, we have Bailey promoted to vice president of the Erie. And from this article from April 18th of 1914, we have a much larger photograph discussing probably likely many of Bailey's images we'll be looking at today throughout Orange County. Seen here is this discussion of scenes photographed by J.E. Bailey from New York City to Chicago. And moving forward, we have here he has taken three views of every station on the entire system, as we'll see today. So some of you may certainly be curious of how I've been able to colorize this image. And it was certainly a search that took a great deal of time. I've been searching for a while for uh, certain softwares, both mobile by my iPhone and software on the computer that could colorize. And the best one I was able to find was this program called deepai.org. Um, it is free, which is certainly beneficial to all of us. And it does quite a good job at colorizing these early images. Now, something that I should point out to everyone, no AI software is perfect and they should not be trusted fully. Something to remember, of course, is that the AI will only colorize aspects of an image that it knows to be true. For instance, most trees are green, so trees will be colorized towards that fashion. Same with elements such as sky and water tones. It will not, have, um, for example, know that the front um, decal of an Erie E8 is yellow, and it will not color that yellow. So 
um, you have to remember that when looking at these images, but certainly even colorizing certain aspects of an image uh, picks up certain details and gives a new perspective that you often can't see to earlier kinds of images. So this morning we'll be focusing in Orange County, New York. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the region, I welcome you to seeing some new perspectives of Eero history. For those that aren't from the area, I welcome you to the region. Um, this is one of the Erie's first areas. We'll be looking specifically today at the Erie Road's main line, which was opened in its entirety with the first train running to Port Jervis at the Western End in 1848. The stations we'll be stopping at today include Tuxedo, followed by Southfields, then Harriman, Monroe, Oxford Depot, Braycourt, Chester, Goshen, New Hampton, Middletown, Howells, Otisville, Guymard, and Port Jervis. I would also like to note that Bailey um, photographed the original alignment of the main line, which means we will be riding along the old main line between Harriman and Howells, as well as the old main line between Howells and Guymard. This morning, we'll be beginning at Tuxedo at the southern point of Orange County, as well as the Erie's entrance into Orange County. Along with most of Bailey's images, he provided these neat sketches of the station and main line going around the um, area. You can see here, this main structure is the Tuxedo Station, while in the background is the double-tracked Erie Main Line. Now, Tuxedo was certainly not the largest station along the Erie in Orange County, but it was certainly one of the most grand. Here is a modern-day view of the same area, of the course of Tuxedo Station right in the center. These scenes are all taken between 1909 and 1911. In these scenes of Tuxedo, we can see that the station platforms are getting some renovations. Here's a view of the south side of Tuxedo Station. Again, we can see some workers performing some renovations, rebuilding the concrete platforms. Some interesting details to note on the station. Um, we can see some of the uh, handmade barricades with wooden plywood and barrels to avoid people from walking to the unfinished platform region. We can also see the unique weather vane with the letter T embossed to the initial. Um, the original weather vane is currently in the possession of the Tuxedo Historical Society nearby the station. Today, a replica has been erected onto the top of the station. Across the street from, I should say not across the street, but across the tracks from the station was the Tuxedo Freight Station. It was a largely modest, but nicely designed structure. And here's the front of the station that is often viewed from travelers along Route 17 heading through Tuxedo, either northbound or southbound. And today here is a comparable view all these views I've captured from either Bing Street View or Google Street View to capture the most realism. Um, you can see today the station um, served for a while as the Tuxedo Police Department headquarters, and now it has returned to serving uh, Metro North New Jersey Transit travelers along the Port Jervis line. It is the only station in Orange County to remain within rail reviews. Heading just a few miles north of Tuxedo was the Southfield Station. Again, we have the Erie Main Line in the back, as well as the station building scene here up front. In comparison to Tuxedo, Southfields was far smaller. Um, here's the site today. Uh, Southfields lasted into the 1970s. Station site would be around here at the end of Railroad Avenue in Southfields. As stated before, that structure was much smaller, but still retained the charm of most Erie stations along this line. You can see a neat view of one of the neat likely Dietz or CT Ham station lamps. Now, Southfield was an important stop as it was one of many points along what I called the Ramapo Iron Belt that had several iron mines. Starting in 1868, we had what was called the Southfields Branch Road. It was a small narrow gauge railroad that operated from the vicinity of the station about a mile or so inland to serve the Augusta Southfields Iron Mine. You can note here in the corner a neat eerie early style steam engine that is heading um, northbound or westbound to be a correct, a politically correct past the station. And here is a back view of the station. This is the side that would be facing Road Avenue. You can see an edge of that eerie railroad freight car in the background. 
And as I said before, the station survived well into the 1970s, yet it does not remain today. Uh, this is the same angle, approximately. The only remains of the station that can be noticed is right in the background here. You will notice a piece of concrete fencing that is familiar to Erie Road stations. Moving north, then we come to Arden. Now, Bailey did not provide us with a sketch of Arden, and Arden proves to be a very complicated area. Bailey here photographed to the original Arden station, which would have been located on the other side. Here, of course, is the Erie Main Line, and here is the New York State Thruway. This still represents the location of the original Arden station, which was around into the mid 1950s, after especially the New York State Thruway was placed, that was replaced with a smaller um, smaller structure that has served both as a road station and a post office. It still stands today, although it is no longer used by the railroad or town. Here is the original Arden station. Um, it largely resembles many of the Erie's other older stations, such as those at Allendale and Ramsey. Something I always found interesting about this particular view of Arden, which I've seen several times before, is this tower in the background. I am unaware yet of its current function, although I suspect it either had to do with um, some of the tracks that once led to the Greenwood Furnace that was operated by the Parrott family is located almost directly to the right of the photographer. Um, that furnace was operating until approximately 1886 when EA Chairman purchased the entire property. Also, it's important to note that at um, least in the 1903 Muller's Orange County Atlas, this portion of track between Arden and Newburgh Junction, just about a mile north, was um, um, extended from two to four tracks, and that tower could have likely controlled that transition. Also neat to note here is the um, neat eerie semaphore, um, not semaphore, but the neat switch lantern styled like a semaphore, as well as your typical switch marker lantern. Here are some other angles of the Arden station at different viewpoints. Of course, in the top left, we have the famous uh, Piso Cure advertisement, which um, I have accompanied with a bottle. Uh, Piso made um, bottles in several different shades and colors, and they're certainly a unique part as a bottle collector. And in the other scene, we can see a eerie steam engine alongside the Arden station. Now here is a back view of the Arden station. I've done this in comparison to try to provide the best in and out comparison, which is almost impossible, but this is the best I'm able to provide. In the top left scene, this is along the New York State Thruway, that is the southbound lanes. Um, those trees are blocking the Erie right of way right behind, and you can just barely make out the roof of the newer Arden station. The original structure would have been located approximately at that point in the median. In the lower image, here's an overview. Um, this is taken from um, Arden Valley Road, which passes over the Erie right of way and also the New York State Thruway. Um, you can see in the background uh, what is uh, Greenwood Furnace that was operated by the Parrott family until 1886. Later, those structures were used for the Arden Farms Dairy Company, which was operated by EA Chairman from 1896 until the 1970s. This here would be the approximate site of that Arden station that Bailey photographed. And the background, you can see the newer structure that served into the mid 2000s as the region's post office. Now coming north, we come to Turner's, which proves to be an interesting location along the Erie Main Line. Turner's today is better known as Harriman. And that of course happened uh, shortly after Harriman passed away in 1909. In fact, um, after looking here at this location of the main station, Freight House, and mainline, we can see that Bailey indicated that um, the town was changed to the name Harriman from Turner's in July 15th, 1910. Now, Turner's had multiple railroad stations, and in 1865 was the most grand of them, and that was the Orange Hotel. Now, the Orange Hotel would have been located approximately to the left of this photograph here, though we have Route 17. That's the Erie's Bridge going over 17. At this point, we are on the abandoned mainline. This is the site of the newer Harriman station that many of us might remember. And this would have been the site of the Orange Hotel and the later Turner station. Now, this was the Orange Hotel. It's not a Bailey image, but I included it here for some contextualization. It served the village from 1865 until 1873 when it burned down. It was described to be both having a world-class restaurant hotel. It certainly 
stood up there with many of the others Erie Grand Station, such as the one in Susquehanna. Once this burned down in 1873, it was replaced with this unique structure. Um, this is the Turner Station that served the village for over three decades. We can see both here, the passenger and freight station background. That's the freight station. And of course, we can see Gin Bailey noted that this town's name was changed to Harriman on July 15th, 1910. Here are some other angles of the Turner Station. Quite a unique structure, seems modular in design. It's possible that it might have even been standing before the Orange Hotel burned um, in 1873 and served a different purpose. In the background here, this arrow indicates where what's called River Road in Harriman crosses the Erie Main Line. This is the first gray crossing along the old main line after it split from the Graham Line at Newburgh Junction. And it is also today where the Heritage Trail, which is a paved rail trail along the main line, currently starts today. Here's some other angles of the Turner Station. Something that always intrigued me about these views was the scenes of the foundation of the structure in the bottom right hand corner, especially this unique little tunnel here. It's possible that these might have been remains from the old Orange Hotel. And here are some views just north of the freight station, quite a substantial size freight station as well. Also viewable is the water column that served um, engines stopping at Turner's. There was quite a sizable amount of tracks here, not exactly a yard, I'd say, but definitely enough to service some smaller engines. Captivating the site of the Turner station to be somewhat hard because there are not exactly any roads that pass by it. So we're gonna transition right at the same location to Harriman. Here we have again the um, Erie's Bridge that passes over Route 17 that is still intact today. Notice it is for two tracks. And this site here will be the proximate location of the Harriman station that was torn down in 2006. Here is the new Harriman station erected in 1911. Quite a unique structure. Harriman became important for a lot of reasons shortly after the structure was completed um, in 1912. We had the dedication of the Minot Monument, which um, commemorated the first transmitted telegraph by train in 1851. If you take a close look at the photograph to the upper left hand image, you'll see some construction in the background. That is for what is commonly known in the region as the powerhouse. Uh, during mid um, between 1900 and 1910, E.A. Chairman had this structure built. We do know that it was a powerhouse in some form. There are images of the interior with generators clearly seen. What it powered remains a mystery. One of the common myths is that it would have proved to be a substation along the Erie's planned electrification line between Jersey City and Port Jervis. Um, that's again a myth we have yet to fully confirm that. There's also been rumors that it was to power some aspects of Harriman's estate as well as some of the iron mines that he owned the area. What is known, however, is that after Harriman's death, those plans fell through. And in 1911, the original shops that were used to help construct Arden House burned to the ground. So those shops moved into the powerhouse and its surrounding buildings. And thus we had what was called the Harriman Industrial Corporation, which helped construct many other buildings in the area, such as the Monroe Station along the Erie Railroad, the newer one. Later in the 1940s, um, this structure became absorbed into the Naparita Chemical Company, which remained in use until the early 2000s. And in 2015, 2016, that structure was fully demolished. Now, as stated earlier, the Harriman station was torn down in 2006, yet fortunately, some of the individuals involved in that demolition saw the station's history and preserved many of its architectural components, some of which have made it to my collection. Seen here is one of the freight doors in my backyard. And over here is both the later Harriman station sign from the 1960s and 1970s, as well as one of the eave buttresses that can be seen in the top of that photograph. Here is a back view. This is facing, uh, this will be Grove Street in Harriman, New York of the Harriman Station. Really a neat structure, unique among the Erie stations heading through Orange County. And the background, we can see a neat style signal along the main line. And this is almost exactly the same angle today. I said the station was demolished in 2006 and the site remains vacant. In the corner here, you can see a bit of the curb line that served the parking lot for the station at one point in time. And back here would have been the location of the Minot Monument erected in 1912. Um, there have been many stories about 
how the plaque has vanished and returned over time today remains missing. However, the concrete monument itself still remains intact. Just north of Turner's is Monroe. We'll be looking today at the original Monroe station that served the town throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Here is that structure and behind it, of course, is the Erie's main line. And this arrow indicates Lake Street, which is the main thoroughfare through Monroe. This is the same angle today. The original Monroe station still stands. That's the structure right here. And behind you can see the Erie's main line in the form of the paved heritage trail. For anyone coming to Orange County, I do highly recommend the heritage trail. It's a fully paved trail. It's now currently being extended through Middletown. It is a wonderful walk. Here is the original Monroe Station, a very unique structure in many ways that com uh, combine both the freight and passenger operations. Here are two other views showing the front and back of the station. You can see off to the left in this photograph, one of the eerie sightings that ran into and directly into downtown Monroe. You can also see that off to the side here. Those sightings were later removed when this area was largely developed with businesses. Here's a scene again of the original Monroe station from Lake Street. And this is the same building today. Um, it's obviously still standing. It's had some differences. One of the few old historical elements that can still be identified are those um, eave buttresses that remain. We now move to Oxford Depot, which like Monroe was another interesting station. Um, it served as both the village's train station, post office and general store operated by the DiStefano family. You can even see here that Bailey noted that the building was not owned by the company. This little portion here that sticks out from the main building was the only part that served as the station. The rest served other purposes. And of course, over here, Bailey indicated both the Erie's main line as well as the freight room. This is the site today. I apologize for the tree coverage. It's hard to point some aspects of the region out, but here's the main line as seen at the cut in trees. This, of course, is today's Heritage Trail, part of the original section, opened in the 1990s. And this roof line here is the Oxford Depot station, which does still stand today. Here's a scene at that station. As I said before, definitely a neat structure. That little wooden addition to the back was the station itself, while the rest served the Stefano family. Michael De Stefano started operating general store here around 1901, and later he had a large dairy farm and creamery. Um, of course, here's that wooden addition, and here's a milk bottle from De Stefano's dairy in Oxford Depot. Looking at other scenes of the station, you can see in the upper left portion that freight room that's off to the left of the main station structure, as well as some other details about the station itself, becomes pretty clear by the architectural design that this was certainly not a building built or operated by the railroad itself. Now, this is among one of my most favorite images from Bailey in Orange County for many reasons. We do have the Erie represented through the station itself. We also have the Alex Campbell Mill Company seen in the background. Alex Campbell was a pioneering dairyman, um, especially in 1878 when he is recorded to have used the first glass milk bottle. Um, we are unknown. Uh, we have yet to find a dedicated example of that first glass milk bottle, but his business re remained prosperous until around 1919. And he operated several creameries across Orange County, include the one here in Oxford Depot and also one in Monroe. We can see, of course, here how the DeStefano structure was used both as the post office and general store. And back here with the Alex Campbell Milk Company's Oxford Depot Creamery. And here are some bottles from Alex Campbell, uniquely designed. This is the same shot today. A lot has changed except for the uh, building itself that housed the station, which still stands. It's had an interesting addition placed onto the second story, almost like a covered porch but it even seems that sign that represented the post office still remains today. Heading westbound, we come to Great Court, which is one of the most important stops along the Erie between Tuxedo and Port Jervis. Great Court um, was, of course, along the Erie's main line, but it all served as the terminus and junction of two other railroads, the Lehigh and Hudson River, seen in the bottom of this photograph, 
transferred here cars between the Erie, and this was also the southern terminus of the Newburgh branch, which opened in 1850 as Newburgh's first railroad. Seen here is the Erie's rain line, and on that very top track, you can see it's indicated NB branch for Newburgh branch. Here is the large Great Court Station, which is divided into three parts. We have the baggage room at the far western side, the waiting room in the center, and an office at the far eastern side. And below, of course, we have the Lehigh and Hudson River Railroad tracks that are heading into the transfer yard just to the east of the station. Here's the same view today. The Great Court Station um, vanished probably, uh, I'd say, by 1969, 1970, although the yard itself remained active until the Erie's main line was abandoned in 1983. At that point, the yard was removed and two tracks were uh, rebuilt and realigned. They serve as team tracks today, especially among the local produce growers of the uh, Pine Island region. Here is the Heritage Trail, which runs right alongside those tracks um, through here between Oxford Depot and Chester. That is the bridge carrying the Lehigh and Hudson Rivers tracks over the Heritage Trail and their tracks heading to the old Great Court Transfer Yard. They are still used very actively today. And this is the site of the old Great Court Station. Here is the magnificent Great Court Station. This is taken from the side of the Erie, looking westbound. In the background, you can make out the Lehigh and Hudson Rivers bridge passing over the Erie, which does still stand today. Here are some other views of the Great Court Station, a unique structure um, with its three different modules. Some aspects were used by the LNA Charwar either's, while others were used by the Erie. Back there is the Railroad Hotel. That was one of the main businesses in Great Court, and it burned down in the 1930s. Just to the west of the Great Court Station was the Freight House. This again served both the LNHR and Erie Railroads and was situated between both tracks. Uh, the scene at the top left is taken from the Erie side, while the other two images are taken from the LNHR side. And right here you can see the um, LNHR bridge once again passing overhead both tracks. Here's a relatively well-known view of one of Bailey's images of the Great Court Station. This is taken from the Lee Hunter's inverse side, looking westbound. And here's approximately the, the same angle today. You can see a little bit in the foreground some of the tracks that were rebuilt in the late 1980s to service local industries. The Great Court Station would have been located approximately at this location. And, and back in the trees behind there is where the LNHR would have passed over the region's main line and transfer tracks. We now head into Chester and we'll be looking at the original station that preceded the 1915 structure. You can see that structure here along with the Erie's main line once again. This is a scene today. Um, we can of course see the newer 1915 Chester station in the middle along with the Heritage Trail that passes this region. This is the original 1915 Chester Station that served throughout the 19th century. Chester in particular proved to be an important spot along the Erie's main line in 1841 when Thaddeus Selleck, who was a contractor along the Erie, was appointed as the station agent here. Now, when he was appointed as station agent, he immediately began to realize the pure quality of Orange County's milk. And it um, would have fulfilled what was at that time an empty and needing market. At this time, there were no high forms of transportation. The Erie was at the point the first road in Orange County. And before then, the only way to transport commodities such as dairy products to New York City was to take them by horse and carriage either to Cornwall or Newburgh, where they would be taken then by barge to New York City. Uh, milk could certainly not last to that period of time. However, with the railroad that offered a new form of transportation, and especially in a needing market, whereas in New York City, we had what was known as swill milk, which was milk that was produced by disease-ridden cows fed on uh, grains from brewery stables. It took a while for Selleck to find a farmer willing to agree to his plan, as this was really um, uncharted territory. But in 1842, he convinced Philo Gregory of Chester, a local dairy farmer, to transport 240 quarts of milk bound from New York City. It was very successful, and it spurred Orange County's burgoing dairy industry. And we can see the memorial marker commemorates that first milk transport.
Here are some more scenes of the Erie Station. You may notice in the upper left-hand photograph that quite ornate house in the background. That house does still remain today. This is taken from Bank Street in Chester. In the background there, you can see some tracks that led into the middle of Chester. There were quite a few um, sidings branching from the Erie's main line that directly serviced um, businesses within the village itself. Those tracks have been removed long ago, but if you ever take the time to visit Chester, you will still find one of the concrete stumping blocks remaining within the village. Here's a scene taken from what is today, I believe Wilkins Place of the Chester Station, the original structure. And compared with today, this is the 1915 structure that now serves the Chester Historical Society. Moving west from Goshen, we come, moving west from Chester, we come to Goshen, which like Great Court was a hub of activity. Here is the Goshen Station, quite a large and long structure. And we have three Erie, uh, we have two Erie branches that converge with the main line at this location. Here, of course, is the main line. And up top, we have the Montgomery branch that would have allowed Erie trains to travel, at least before the Grand Moyer structure, to locations such as Maybrook and um, Montgomery itself. And below here, we have the beginnings of the Pine Island branch that would have transferred trains down through Florida and Pine Island. This track was also used with trackage rights by the Lehigh New England Railroad, which would have traveled over the Pine Island branch and later Montgomery branch to access Maybrook from Pennsylvania. Here's a similar scene today. This region has been heavily developed. The Goshen Station does still stand and it serves as the village's police station. Um, you may also notice in some areas, um, some angles of buildings that represent what was once passed. Um, this railroad avenue indicates the original trajectory of the Erie's main line. You may notice an angle in this building here that would represent that first little stub of the Erie's Pine Island branch. And up top, you'll notice a small structure here. That structure actually stands on a bridge that carries the old Montgomery branch over a small creek heading towards Montgomery. Here's the Goshen Station. This is the south end. We are, this is the east end. We are looking westbound towards Middletown and Port Jervis. In the foreground, you can see that switch that is likely um, emanating from that Pine Island Branch Junction. In the background here also is where the Montgomery Branch would have converged with the Erie's main line. Here's some other scenes of Goshen, again, a hub of activity. Goshen itself not only interchanged passengers with the Erie Main Line, but also the long gone Middletown Goshen Trolley. Middle, um, Orange County itself was um, home to three major trolley lines, those being the Middletown, um, the Middletown Goshen Trolley, the Newburgh and Walton Trolley, as well as the Port Jervis Traction Company. <clears throat> Goshen had a sizable freight station as well. Um, this is located just to the west of the station. Uh, but also, I did see some pictures on the ELHS Facebook page, and I believe it was still standing up into the 1970s. Here's a scene from the, um, this is the back side of um, the Goshen Station. This is not the side facing the um, Erie Main Line, but instead the Montgomery Branch, which can be seen here. And here is the same structure today. It's, as said before, been restored and is in use by the Goshen Police Department. And uh, you may also notice here some um, designs in the sidewalk that still radiate what once was passed. This was, of course, relating to where the Montgomery branch used to run along this side, heading towards Montgomery. We now come to New Hampton, which, a lot like Munro and Oxford Depot, was a unique station in many ways. We can see the Erie's main line up front. And this also, like Oxford Depot, served as the region's post office. Um, the station is gone today, as can be seen here. The main line, which can be hard to see here, this part has now been opened as the Heritage Trail, would have operated approximately along this trajectory. And this would have been the site of the old New Hampton station. Structure also served as the region's post office and possibly a few more aspects as well. Here are some other angles of the New Hampton station.
And just to the west of that is um, was the freight station. We can see in these bottom two photographs, we can have an Erie station, and not an Erie station, an Erie, a small Erie steam engine pictured here. But if you also notice to the photograph to the right of that one, you can see what appears to be a very small train there. I suspect that might be the same train. Given a short contest, it might have been a local coming from perhaps Middletown to do some freight transfers at this location. It's pretty impossible to find the site of the New Hampton station today, so I have provided an alternative. In the background of the scene, you will notice a larger structure with a second story porch. That building does still stand today and is today's Mason's Marketplace. Um, it's a very good restaurant. I recommend anyone walking along the Heritage Trail, which runs right, I didn't put an arrow there, which right, the Heritage Trail runs right to the left of the structure. Um, it provides very nice food and refreshment for anyone walking along this part of the old main line. Middletown, we come to now, had two stations for the Erie. The first of these, which is possibly not as known to many of us here, was the station at East Main Street. Now, you might wonder, why did the Erie have a station here if they had a larger structure at James Street, which we'll see later? Well, this was the only point at where all of Middletown's railroads converged. We had here junctions with the Erie, the Middletown in Unionville, later the MNNJ, the New York, Ontario, Western, and also the Middletown in Goshen Trolley, again, converged all at this point. Here we have uh, the station with a very large passenger shelter. This building today is a switch in and does still stand today. And to the north of here, just north would be the MNU station, which does still stand today, although it is no longer being used by the railroad. Here's the same region today. That structure we discussed earlier is the switch in. There it is today. And here is the MNU station later today, better known as the MNNJ station along East Main Street. So here is that East Main Street station with the very large passenger platform. Um, that's, of course, the Erie's double-tracked mainline in the foreground. In the background, we can see the Erie's East Main Street Tower in Middletown. Here are some other scenes of East Main Street bustling with activity. In the top left image, we have in the background the New York Ontario Western Railroads. Um, that's, railroad, that's the Railroad Avenue Tower. That scene looking northbound uh, looks towards the O&W's main station at Wickham Avenue even appears that there's an O&W steam engine that is heading uh, eastbound on that track. And in the bottom scene, we can see a portion of the MNNJ station on the left-hand side. Here's again a scene of the East Main Street station. This is taken that is East Main Street itself in the foreground. In the background, you can see the water tower for what was known as DG Yard. DG Yard was um, a point allowing was the main service area in um, Middletown for the Middletown and Unionville Road and later the Middletown New Jersey Road. That water tower stood, I think, well into probably the 1950s. The base for it still remains today. Um, and of course, back, uh, keep note of the structure that is today the switch in. And as we see today, that building does still stand right here. And you can even see, I don't believe they're for the main line, but these were railroad ties that uh, once served as a connection between the main line and the um, MNNJ. Um, the tracks were removed a couple of years ago, but the ties do still remain today. Now heading just west, we come to the Erie's main st uh, station at James Street. This structure replaced an earlier two-story building. We have here that station itself, along with the sizable Erie main line in the background. Here is the James Street Station today. It remained derelict for some period in the 1980s. However, it serves today as Middletown's Thrall Library. You'll see that station here. This large portion in the back is an addition to the uh, original structure, and it sits directly on the path of the Erie's main line. Also, just to the south here is a little baggage room that also stands, I believe, today as a used book depository for the Thrall Library. Here's a scene of the Erie's James Street Station. Again, a neat structure that was built um, in 1896. Some other scenes of the James Street Station in Middletown, various angles. This was located pretty much right in the center of Middletown. It was a couple blocks away from North Street, which is, uh, was the main thoroughfare through the city.
And right across the from the station was the Erie's Freight House. This is in its original configuration. Later, a brick addition was added on to the east end of it and remained in service through the 1980s. If you notice here, um, me and my friend are doing some ins insulator discoveries um, in these images, and we found two neat uh, parts to the image in the top, top right-hand corner. You'll see first here some barrels in the foreground. They're for the Standard Oil Company, Standard Oil Company of New York, Middletown, New York. And over here, you'll see two insulators along the side of the structure. We did some checking and those seem to be indeed some of the famous ERWs. There are several other images throughout this uh, presentation that also show ERWs along telegraph poles. Here's another scene again of the James Street station taken from James Street itself and a comparable image today. You can see part of the passenger platform right here, as well as the addition on the back side. We now come to Howells, and we are not on the Graham Line alignment of Howells, but we are rather on the original portion. And this was the old Howell station with the Erie's main line in the foreground. This is the site today. Um, Howell has been heavily developed, although there are some parts recognizable. This part of the Howell's Fire Department is likely where the old station stood. And there are still two abutments here that once serviced the bridge that passed over New Vernon Road. Here is the old Hallow Station. This is a scene that is looking eastbound back towards Middletown. I would say it's a pretty contemporary and average station for a typical rural town along the Erie's main line. Again, we have that piezo here advertisement like on many of the other Erie stations. Here's a scene of the back of the Howell station. And uh, due to limitations, it's hard to get a now version today, but this is the close that I could find. That's the Howell's fire department in the background. The old Erie main line ran directly behind those structures. And this is approximately where the old Howell stations once stood. We now come to Otisville, which was a hub of activity for the Erie, both with the original main line and the later Graham line that involved the Otisville Tunnel. We will today be looking at the old main line. You can see where I passed through the village in two spots here and here. Um, the only real aspect in the middle of town that is a remnant of the old um, station itself is Highland Avenue, which still passes over via bridge over this portion of Otisville. Here's the old Otisville station, which was situated directly in the center of town. Otisville in its time was most famously known for the Borden Screamery located there. It provided a good amount of business for the Erie coming through. And it also kept this part of the main line running for quite some time after the Graham line was constructed. It was pretty difficult for me to compare a then and now image of Otisville. It took me a while to orient myself with the buildings, but when I compare, I wanted to keep an eye on this building in the background and especially the placement of the windows on the structure. If we compare this to today, you can see the same building in the background with those windows. And the approximate site of the old Otisville station would have been around here today. We now come to you know, back from Guymard. I had seen both images of the original station that also served as the region's post office, as well as the newer station when the area was better called as a Graham. Um, here, Bailey indicated the old trajectory of the highway, which is Guymard Turnpike heading through the area, as well as what seemed to be a small station and freight house seen to the right. And I've noticed some interesting parts here, which said this is a coach and this is a box car that will come into interest later. Here's the same site today. Um, the original route of the IMR Turnpike would have been right through about this area. Now reflecting on what we saw earlier with uh, Paul's image of Lackalax, and I'm gonna share some similar images today. Um, later, I just wanna go on. This is the site of FX Tower, which was the conversion of the old mainline Graham line. And this is the site of the new Graham station. So when I discovered the Guymard images, this is what I was happily surprised with. This is the scenes that Guymard likely 
not likely, but during the construction of the Erie's Grand Line through the area, this, of course, was the western terminus of the Grand Line. And you know, the station at this time served in an old Erie coach and the freight station behind in a boxcar. Here are some other views of the scenes at Gaimard with both the coach and the boxcar in different areas. And here's a neat overview of the region. You can see in the foreground the original trajectory of the Gaimard Turnpike, as well as the two elevations for the main line, which can be seen there, and the Grand Line, which happens to be lower. Today, this is approximately the same location. This is Gaimard Turnpike, which now uh, takes a um, hairpin bend over the Erie um, Grand Line and main line at this location, heading towards Port Jervis. You can see there the old trajectory of the main line, which heads at a far steeper grade compared to the Grand Line. We now come to our terminus at Port Jervis. Bailey didn't photograph a lot here, but he certainly took some interesting images. Not just a sketch either, but seen here is the Port Jervis station that is known to many of us, along with um, the two tracks remaining of the Erie Main Line, as well as what was once many more of the Southern Port Jervis coach yard. Here's Bailey's image of the Port Jervis station. Seen here, built in 1892 and enlarged in 1912. Uh, the structure um, <clears throat> was not exactly, I'd say, abandoned, but um, deteriorated through the 1970s. Today, it has been wonderfully restored. Uh, does not serve as the Metro North station today, which somewhat saddens me, but it is still maintained very well in the center of town. Now, that was not Bailey's jewel image in Port Jervis, but this one certainly is much more interesting. This shows the Port Jervis freight station taken above looking down into town. That station, of course, is right here. Um, you can see here how the tracks really penetrated right into Port Jervis, um, the center of the city. This all today is now a site of a shopping mall, which we will see shortly. And this is the site of that area today, not taken from the same angle. This is looking in more the opposite direction. This would have been approximately the site of that freight station. And right in the background here is around the site of um, today's Erie, the Erie turntable portraits and whatever locomotives are on display around that turntable. Well, that comes to the end. To conclude, I included this neat picture of um, an Erie consist heading over the Moodin Viaduct along with the fan trip on the Newburgh branch heading underneath. This is a 1940 image by Russ Halleck. Thank you everyone for joining me this morning. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex, that was great. Paul's going You're to uh, work with you on uh, any questions or comments. Of course. I'm up. I, I have a couple that I did put in the chat, but I'll add. <clears throat> All right, I'll tell you what I have collected here. Uh, Mike Sly is asking uh, or points out, um, you have the stations with gray paint and darker trim. When did the painted buildings get the dark green paint? So it is, as I stated before with the colorizing, it is very possible that these buildings did have um, dark green paint at this time. As I stated previously, the AI software will colorize what it knows to be true, such as trees and, um, the, and aspects of the ground, whatever, possibly sky water. Um, it will not know if a building is green. So that's out of my control. It's possible that these buildings were green or other colors at the time. Um, you know, as I said, it, it's, it's not a perfect system and unless there's a system where you can manually input that I want this and that to be um, colorized, um, it will likely be impossible, but that's um, the best I can do. It's possible that these were all the green at the time, but that's the uh, reality of the situation. Okay. Um, I had a couple questions. I scribbled down to while we're going sure. on. Um, New, uh, New Hampton was two stories and somewhat larger than the rest. Yes. Um, yeah. Was New Hampton an, an important town on the Erie during this time? And what other functions would have been done in such a large rural station? New Hampton doesn't strike me as a very important town. Um, it's my knowledge, I believe there were two creameries that served New Hampton. I think the Diamond Dairy Company, another creamery serviced the area. Apart from that, um, there were no really sizable industries. I suspect that this structure was not built by the railroad. I'm looking at the map. Bailey doesn't indicate whether it was or not built. I suspect though that it was an earlier structure that happened to be adopted by the railroad for use either um, through family use or they happened to buy the structure. There is a clear sign stating here that it was also served as a post office. 
So it's also possible that it might have served also as a general store and perhaps that the station agent himself would have lived in the second story of the structure. Okay, uh, we have one remark here that the, from uh, Cindy Brookshire. Thank you for uh, your hard work on your colorization. A comment from Francis Hig Higby, is that right? Uh, the James Street Station today is an attractive library as well. It, yes, um, yes, yes. I had a question. Uh, are there any plans for the Harriman Station site, the one where they tore it down back in 2004, I believe you said? To my knowledge, I do not know of any plans. I suspect uh, today the Heritage Trail uh, terminates, I'd say, um, not even a quarter of a mile west of the station site. I suspect they would not uh, extend it to the station site itself because you'd have to cross River Road and that's a particularly treacherous and dangerous crossing. You wouldn't want one pedestrians crossing. Um, that area is not exactly developed. One of the issues is right across the street is Napera. And um, at uh, Napera, that site of course is an FDA um, Superfund site and won't be developed for some time. So I suspect that it will remain undeveloped for a large period. And I do not know of any plans for development in the future. Okay. Uh... Let's see here. Uh, Cindy Brookshire, I'm assuming this must be Curtis. Uh, I will say. Uh, I'll still call him Cindy Brookshire for now. Asks, who controls the Bailey images? Is there a source? See more of his images? If not, uh, any chance to see a reprint of the Next Station Will Be series? I can attach the link into the chat where all of Bailey's images are located. Jim Hutzler has conveniently uploaded all of them to a website. And I can attach By the way, I want to also point out. The chat. Uh, sure. I just want to point out uh, while the meeting was going on, I got an, a, uh, a Facebook messenger request from Jim Hutzler for the link for the meeting. So he actually is on the bridge right now. So he's been watching the presentation as well. Okay, great. Um, okay, but you said you're gonna put the link there. Thank you. Yeah, yep, um, I'm searching for it now. Okay. Logan G asks, is the trail okay for bicycles? Absolutely. I apologize. Oh. Is, is the trail okay for bicycles? Oh, it, it is. It is great for bicycles. It's fully paved. Um, you will have no issues. So it's a very smooth ride. Okay. Um, a question about the uh, deep AI program. How steep is the learning curve if you want to try using that yourself to start colorizing images? It is not steep at all. All you literally, all you do is you upload a picture like you're posting a Facebook into this image. It takes about two seconds and you just take it out and it's done. Oh, wow. Okay. It's very, very easy to use. I'm uh, currently getting, all right. I'm attaching um, Jim Hutzler's link for the uh, stations. That's, um, that's his link to all the Erie stations along the line. I can also I'm also going to attach the link to the AI software for colorizing images. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, here's a question actually I had. I saw a picture on Facebook somewhere without an explanation. It was kind of cryptic. It was because we were, you showed the Middletown Freight House. Yes. There's a photo of someone's pickup truck. Yes. With the Middletown Freight House sign, the Erie Freight Station yep. sign in the back of it, hanging way out. Just Look what I got, and no other comments beyond that. Can you have any more information on that? Sure. No, that 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 that's my good friend who also helped in the demol uh, demolition of the Erie Station. He has the Middletown Freight House sign, and uh, he's a collector of um <clears throat> local memorabilia. Okay, so the, the sign is preserved then. The sign is is on display and preserved. That is correct. It was it was the sign itself was actually at a residence in Middletown for forty years, and um that that day he happened to uh just check out the residence and see if it was for sale. And it was, and he acquired it and is now preserved in his collection. Good to hear. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any. I see where was the tower Arden compared to the current station? Um, the tower at Arden, um, Judging from the images, I would say it was located right across the tracks from the current station, probably right across the tracks at the base of the bridge carrying Arden Valley Road over. 
And from Jeff Gabriel, we have, uh, did Bailey take pictures of structures such as interlocking or crossing towers? To my knowledge, no, he did not. He merely focused on passenger and freight stations. Okay, those are all the questions in the chat right now. Uh, if we get more questions in the chat afterwards, I can always forward those on to you, Alex. Sure. But thank you. That was an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a question from John Canizero. What was the name of the chemical company Goshen? Chemical company? I don't know if they... Uh... Chemical Company Goshen, if, if you name a, uh, there's obviously, Nepera? yeah, I was going to say, if you need an Apera, that's in Harriman. That was an E-P-A-R-A, -A, uh, Apera in Harriman. Um, I'm not familiar of a chemical company in Goshen. The main industry there was the Goshen Foundry, which was just west of the station. That uh, The foundry structures do still stand today. Yes, that, that was Nepera. Oh, yes, you meant there. Ne okay. Oh, someone comment. Oh, Sky Larby comments. There's no reason to reprint the Next Station Will Be series. They are regularly available in used book circles. And that, uh, that's the last of the questions. Thank you very much, everyone. It was really fun to be here today. And perhaps I can come back for a second part two on the Erie's branch lines in Orange County, which we did not cover today. Thank you. You're most welcome. I think everyone appreciate that. Maurice, are we keeping the, the bridge open for anyone who wants to just chat? Hey, uh, if you don't mind, I, I do have two quick pictures of the shack, shack at Lackawaxon that I could, I could share real quick. I found them while we were talking. If I'm able to do that, let's see. A horribly dirty slide of an NYSNW uh, Lackwax and Sturbridge um, excursion. I think this was 1983. And on the right, you can see just a part of the, the concrete block station that replaced the, uh, the rec damage station. The, we're looking railroad west here. Uh, the single track main uh, goes west and then curves to the right to go over the, the old uh, bridge over the Lackawaxon River. And uh, going off in the distance to the left would be the Wyoming Division which of course this is intact from out to Hawley and then the Honesdale branch uh, still being used today. And I have one other image shows the station a little bit better. Um, and I, I point out too that uh, just over the roof of the station, you see the the red roofing shingles, that's the Lackawax, the old Lackawax and firehouse, uh, which, which does still remain. The, the, the concrete block station was demolished. I couldn't put a year on it um, when that was done, but it no longer exists. The old firehouse still exists though. It's no longer used as a firehouse. It's part of the, uh, the National Park, Delaware River uh, National Park facilities. And then, of course, the Roebling Aqueduct uh, Bridge, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, would be just out of the picture to the right, uh, crossing the Delaware River. That's all I got. Richard, Richard question popped up for you. Uh, do they still run excursion out of Honesdale? Yeah, there is, there is a, a new operator up there that runs out of Honesdale. I don't know if they run anything to Lackawaxon anymore, uh, but they, uh, there definitely is a, uh, 
um, versions out of Honesdale. I'll see if I can find the link to the website. And regarding the Goshen Station, Ken Martin comments, the west side of the Goshen Station had a sign under the station sign that read Home of the Trotters. I once heard a reason for that, and I don't remember what it is. I'm not sure if Alex is still on. Okay, he must have dropped off. I will put that in the list of questions to send off to him. Hey, Paul. Yes, sir. This is Michael Connor. Uh, Say, listening to some of this, I suggest one project that I think the society is going to take on is this business of when did the station colors you become the one we were familiar with, the green, etc. So we'll we'll put that down on the somewhere in the in the diamond as a you know, let's find answers. Okay, probably help a lot. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, along that same line, Paul, um, from time to time, you will see references to Erie station types, like this is a 2A or a Roman numeral 3B. Uh, and I, I may have asked this question before in, a, in one of our groups, but uh, does anyone know of a catalog that lists these number letter types uh, with uh, um, sketches or drawings of exactly what did a particular type look like. Uh, I think that would be uh, a very useful document to have. I think in the Erie archives or the ELRRHS archives in, in uh, Buffalo or West Seneca, I guess it is, uh, there is like a Jersey Central uh, catalog that they have there. And I wondered, uh, did such a thing exist uh, for the Erie or the Lackawanna? It would be fascinating to see uh, the different types and what the numbers were and so on. Well, we'll add that to the let's find it list. Thank you. I have one more thing. Uh, uh, years ago, I got uh, the field <coughs> New York station sign from Paul Kuda. And when I got it, I realized that that station sign, and it's the, uh, the more modern one that has the, Hel I think it's Helvetica uh, lettering style, the, 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 the white with black letters and the black border. <coughs> And if you look at that, uh, you will see that embossed uh, on it, it, it was made out of, of scrap wood from the earlier style station sign. And you can make out, uh, and the, the boards have been turned this way and that way as they reconstructed the, the sign, but you can see it was the old <coughs> station sign for Montclair Heights, uh, New Jersey. Uh, so it's actually two station signs in one. Uh, the uh, newer Thiel's made out of the old Montclair Heights. So I wonder how often that practice was followed with uh, station signs and scrap wood and so on. What, what's, the, what's the actual station sign? The it's, latest iteration? It's painted uh, Thiel's New York, which Thiel's is New York. Uh, what, uh, it's on the Spring Valley, near Spring Valley. Uh, it's on the, uh, what is it, New Jersey and New York, that is. Okay, and uh, so th they made that sign out of scrap lumber that has embossed. The older signs, they didn't just paint, they had some kind of maybe a heat type of stamp, but actually you can see where the old um, serif style letters, and it clearly was uh, for Montclair Heights. Again, they had put the boards together in a different, uh, you know, turn them upside down, but you can make out from the remnants of the letters it was Montclair Heights, but it's now, it has been for, I don't know, the last <laughs> 80 years or or maybe more uh, feels, but that's another 
station idea. That would be great to publish in the diamond too. I'd love to see photos of the front and back of that. That's yeah. That also yeah. changed the Erie's. You know, the Erie was always kind of hurting for for pennies. So right. Uh, that, that's quite a move from Montclair Heights to Fields. I know where both of them are. And yeah, yeah. Felt like they're right at the door. So they must have taken it down, brought it down to Jersey City, whatever, and they said, "Hey, we need a new sign for Fields." And I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Or, or did they have a, a scrap uh, Erie Railroad scrap lumber depot? I mean, yeah, they didn't throw good stuff away. No. I, I could add to that um, recycling aspect. Uh, I've looked at several of the plans for bridges on the uh, Graham line and the main line, and I was surprised to see how many of them had references to, you know, uh, these two angle irons from bridge so-and-so over here and mm -hmm. this beam from this bridge over, like they were salvaging as they were replacing uh, bridges they were salvaging the parts from them um, one of the most famous examples that miraculously still exists today is at shin hollow um up just east of port jervis where the um the bridge which is closed uh, it was a fire road bridge, very tiny bridge. Um, but it, the main beams of that bridge were the turntable at Little Falls, New Jersey. Mm. And that's mentioned right in the, the drawings because for a bridge engineer to look at the, the actual steel, there's a set of the original turntable drawings in the file. Um, and then the, the vertical members came from some other bridge west of Port Jervis. So yeah, they were very thrifty. Yeah, they never threw anything away. Well, Paul. I already heard me that one of his stories mentioned that, uh, I can't remember which direction it went, there was a um, a signal mast at, I believe it was Great Notch, and the comparable signal mast by Otisville Tunnel was demolished and erect. They plucked out the one at Great Notch and moved it over there to replace the demolished one. So I think that was an EL... Actually, with an EL or Erie or something, I'm not sure which. But that's another example of uh, creative reuse or repurposing. Sorry, Randy, you're about to say something. Yeah, the uh, many of the images, uh, the Bailey images, that we, as we call them, show a short consist of locomotive and a car or two, and a, probably a boxed car in a caboose. I have seen it hypothesized that that was his train that they had given him a train, a locomotive and a boxcar for his stuff and a caboose to ride in so that they would know where he was and he would get to where he was supposed to be. I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, I, I, if you examine the pictures and find the same boxcar in all of them, that would explain it. I think I've heard a similar story. So that's another one we can get the truth of pinned down now. Thank you. And it certainly makes a lot of sense given the time frame we're talking about, right? 1909, um, you know, the road network was pretty minimal and um, automobiles were not all that common. So uh, what better way to, to follow the railroad than via the railroad? 1809? 1909. Okay. Well, the Detroit Publishing Company, didn't they also have the lack want to run a short train for them for their photography. I think it was 1900. I think we pulled a similar thing there as well. But that, that sure sounds plausible. I'll, I'll mention that to Alex um, in the notes to him. But yeah, that, that certainly does seem like a plausible theory on that. I would, if I could just mention one more thing, I was just watching, looking at some pictures on Facebook this morning that the, uh, the model board at WC Tower in Waldwick, New Jersey was, they put, the tower's been saved and restored by the Waldwick Historical Society and the model board uh, was, um, New Jersey Transit had the model board in storage and it's now been returned to the tower and it is, uh, it's been restored and is hanging, was hung today up in the, uh, in the tower itself. The machine is not in there but the model board now is. Yeah, um, we're 
Well, actually, the Bergen Rockland chapter of NRHS, uh, where uh, Kurt is uh, a member, he um, is uh, planning to put in a small uh, model railroad, I guess, HO or whatever scale. And uh, he's going to hook it up to that model board so that when visitors come in, especially kids, it can actually throw a switch on the model board and it'll uh, actuate something on the small model railroad. Uh, he has plans of doing that. Well, I certainly look forward to getting over there to visit. Excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, there's also a small garden that was developed next to the tower and where there's benches and things. And uh, if anybody wishes to donate to the development or the support of the tower, they could have a memorial uh, brick with their name uh, created and put into the uh, bricks that are already there in the garden. That was good. Sorry, I've been talking into mute. <laughs> this is the uh, the turntable I was mentioning earlier. This is at Shin Hollow, a few miles east of Port Jervis. Paul, I don't know if I'm doing bad or good to mention this, but years ago, there was a legend or a ghost story that the tale of the Y in Waldwick held a derelict locomotive off the Erie. It was buried. They, the story went. It's one of those hidden, vanished locomotives, ghost stories. I don't know whether there's anything to it. I doubt it very much, but... I just thought it'd be fun to say. <laughs> I, I think a metal attacker would go a long way in uh, figuring out that's true or not. <laughs> I, I think it probably grew from some time when they had to dig something out of the snow. <laughs> Good story. That comes from oh. the old Sto that comes from the old Stoker days. Oh, okay. Paul, uh, just as a note to the uh, inquiry as to the Goshen Station having home of the trotter, uh, there were two racehorse tracks in Goshen. Um, one was uh, home to the Hamiltonian uh, contest, which was a trotting horse race. Uh, home of the Trotter refers to horse racing. And uh, there were, uh, as I say, two tracks in Goshen. One is named Good Time Park, and the, uh, which is uh, the, the, the half mile track that's still in operation. The one uh, that was close to uh, Route 17 or Quickway. Um, that has been torn down. Okay, well, I answered that question. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions popped in the ch chat window here. 
A uh, comment from Mark Schmidt, uh, the Lackawanna recycled old station signs regularly. I've seen documentation of the sign painter at Kingsland recycling signs for Johnson City, New York. Uh, Erie Bridge recycling includes the Peckman River Bridge on the Caldwell Branch, which came from the old HX Bridge in 1916. And Mike Sly comments, I seem to recall that the Erie had one location where modern station signs were prepared and that they were painted by only one man for years. Can this be confirmed? That's another good question. I'm, I'm banking these questions. This would be a good thing if we can't answer them on the calls to put in the diamond in the Q&A section. <clears throat> Thank you for the discussion. And uh, again, thank you to Alex for a great presentation today. I, I think we probably want to see him back because I thought he did a really splendid job on that. Um, we did, someone had asked if we have, uh, when the next meeting is, we're skipping Easter weekend. And the next meeting right now is tentatively, well, it, it, not tentatively, is scheduled for April 10th. Uh, we have a presenter lined up. Uh, who's on this call right now. So I'm not going to say anything. I'll let, uh, we'll wait till we get it lined up and we'll send a uh, details and presentation out uh, probably next week sometime. So check your inboxes for that. We're still looking for presenters for future weeks beyond April 10th. Uh, if you have anything at all you'd like to show um, or discuss, please reach out to me. Uh, and we'll, we'll get you all set up. We'll take care of uh, getting you set up with the Zoom uh, client. And we'll show you how to run that if you're not familiar with it. If anyone has slide presentations they want to show, we will scan the slides and make digital presentations for you to go through if you need that. That was one of the common complaints I heard that a lot of people have slide carousels of presentations, but we can't do slide presentations, obviously, in this type of format. So we can scan the slides, put them into a PowerPoint presentation, you can just walk through that on Zoom. So it'll be effectively the same thing as doing a slide presentation. So if you just have physical slides, don't be afraid to reach out. We can help you get that set up as well. That's all I got. Any, uh, I think that ends the presentation part of the show. Uh, I believe Jim Dent's gonna leave the bridge up for as long as need be if people wanna stick around and just discuss things all, discuss all things EL, Erie, DL, and W. The bridge will be open for discussion among the membership. Otherwise, enjoy this gorgeous weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.